Okay. Good morning and welcome to this uh, webinar on the question of the EU strategic uh, it, um, autonomy in the era of global internet governance. Uh, and my name is uh, Pete Steele. I'm chairman of the European Asia Centre and retired Belgian ambassador. And I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all the participants in this uh, webinar. Uh, they were already mentioned uh, by Matic, and I would also uh, like to thank Matic, who is a good friend and uh, Deputy Director of the European Asia Centre, and he also will be the moderator uh, of this morning's webinar and questions and answers um, afterwards. Uh, I have been asked to say a few words to introduce the subject uh, of the webinar and to set the scene of the discussion today. Uh, and I, I try to summarize that in a couple of points, you know, uh, I, it's not going to be a long speech. I'm not, not an expert on, 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 on technology, but I try to get the strategic uh, importance of it, uh, particularly for Europe. And as you know, over the last two decades, the impact of new and emerging technologies and increased digitalization become the prime drivers of uh, globalization and international competition. And states around the world are making digital autonomy, uh, technological supremacy and innovation the cornerstones of their diplomatic security and economic efforts. The COVID pandemic, you know, uh, has further highlighted the importance of digital transformation in all aspects of society. And we, you know, we are approve of it this morning is our Zoom meeting. And as well as the need to reduce strategic dependencies in key high-end technologies, value and supply chains and critical infrastructure. Technology has been and remains a key ingredient for global power projection. And the European Union is no exception and is laying the foundations of multiple sovereignties for the next 20 years. The rallying cry, I may say, in today's Brussels is for the EU to learn the language of power and secure its digital and economic future. This is a recent development in the EU. And in 2016, the EU's global strategy was published, putting the concept of strategic autonomy on the EU's foreign and security policy agendas. The narrow focus of strategic autonomy on defense and security and cybersecurity has been recently expanded by the European Commission under President Ursula von der Leyen. The EU wants to revamp the European power agenda in various strategic sectors, encompassing discussions about technological protectionism and capacity building in areas as digitalization data, space, energy, artificial intelligence, quantum technology, and other emerging technologies. They are potential game changers for increased European action in the world. This new technological sovereignty policy is meant to build an EU consensus around the need to preserve EU European leadership and autonomy in various technological areas by putting forward a pragmatic and autonomous approach to avoid dependencies and geopolitical pressures in critical sectors. The EU's, and we know that, the EU's competitive edge primarily resides in its market normative and regulatory power. And they call it, uh, you know, the Brussels effect. And in the current international climate of, of a so-called technological competition between superpowers, there is still a long way to go for Europe to become a leader in socially responsible and sustainable high-tech industries. The, you all remember the EU General Protection Regulation, which is seen as a first building block in Europe's quest for a sustainable technological power. And I will give you another example of this, is the recent uh, European Commission white paper on artificial intelligence, 
and which has proposed creating an ecosystem of trust in Europe by putting forward a legal framework that addresses the risk for fundamental rights and safety under the label of a secure, human-centered and trustworthy artificial intelligence, which is quite remote from the biometric identification systems, for instance, considered in Europe as high risk and, and which are subjected to strict requirements. And also the use of artificial intelligence in social scoring systems or uh, a AI applications to manip manipulate human behavior are prohibited in Europe. So finally, and in for my introduction, in the EU thinking, technological autonomy and sovereignty are not contradictory with the new opportunities for multilateral cooperation and innovation. Having regard for the differences, of course, between the world's main partners, not, nor are there any contradictory those, those developments with rules-based international open trading system. So those are a couple of points uh, I wanted to make as an introduction. I know the discussion will probably also focus on more technical points, um, such as, you know, Internet of Things. And I'm very, of course, very interested in, in, in learning more about the subject. But um, this is uh, the background uh, of what I think is happening in Brussels uh, the, coming, the coming years on technology and, um, and innovation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Steele, uh, the Chairman of the European Asia Centre. I'm really happy to invite uh, further to the podium, virtual podium today, um, the Your Excellency, uh, former Commissioner for Transport and Mobility in the term between 2014 and 2019, Miss Violeta Burz, uh, who was also a former um, Deputy Prime Minister of Republic of Slovenia and um, as well as a very experienced business, business executive in the telecommunicative sector. So without further ado, Madam Commissioner, uh, the word is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for an excellent introduction and um, thank you for the warm welcome to this session. Um, I have 15 minutes, so uh, we can either dive really deeply into technological and uh, high tech challenges, uh, but I decided to, uh, to go with you um, through the observations that I was able to uh, capture during my mandate and of course during my long uh, career in the high-tech world uh, just to maybe remind everyone that we should never forget that technology is only a tool and not a goal what i'm very much concerned is that uh, with this uh, competitive mindset uh, we try to push technology as a goal and forget that it has to serve uh, uh, and hopefully today I will be able to raise this uh, issue to the level that I capture your attention as well. Uh, allow me to share uh, some of the slides that I prepared for you, uh, just to, uh, to give you a little bit more uh, insight. Uh, but if that's not possible, I can just go ahead. So uh, first of all, uh, there are some uh, mega trends that uh, we certainly uh, should not overlook when discussing uh, the technology, especially because if you take a look at the last 30 years, these megatrends have been pretty much the same, but on many of them, uh, no matter how much we try, we have not found the right solutions. No matter how much technology we pour into it, we do not find the right solutions. For example, uh, climate change and poverty are two of the things that uh, we use all the high tech to try to address it, but what is happening, the gap is broadening. Uh, so uh, shall we challenge ourselves and ask, is technology really the only solution to the problem? Or do we need to go back to the assumptions and then reuse technology for a, in a different way? Um, the same applies to pandemic, uh, as it was mentioned already by Piet, it, we've uh, discovered that technology can help us dramatically. But um, all of a sudden, I have an impression that technology is used for many other things, but addressing the pandemic issues. Uh, and uh, we have 
uh, lack of governance and lack of uh, public uh, control over the way how the applications are designed and what are the multiple uses and what comes along with the solutions that are originally claimed to be for uh, improving the uh, health conditions and public health and interoperability in the fields of science in order to address the, the challenge. Uh, as well, of course, this digitalization is besides um, uh, besides uh, climate change, poverty, and uh, pandemic is one of the mega trends, um, uh, but it's a horizontal underlying issue uh, that is basically entering every single um, uh, area of our engagement. But what we can see that the solutions are becoming more and more global, but there is no governance. There is no governance over the technological solutions whatsoever. So uh, in one way, we are completely depend, uh, depending on, uh, on using this uh, and uh, uh, basically finding solutions for our economical and social challenges while have no control over what is really in those applications and what are the purposes that they serve. So uh, with this kind of uh, challenging uh, mind, uh, I'd like to uh, also discuss uh, the, the latest European uh, moves. The European Union uh, is not a country, it's a project. It's an ever evolving project. Uh, and that's its beauty. It has no head really, so it can respond very quickly to the different conditions that uh, occur uh, in the world. And <clears throat> no matter how much critique the European Union uh, receives, we have to admit in the, the last uh, eight years, the crisis were one after the other, severe crisis that in the past were each of them a reason for serious conflicts. However, because this dynamic network-based structure was in place, uh, so far we have found solutions to every single one of them, being uh, um, migration and refugees, being uh, terrorism, being a social crisis, being a, a financial crisis, being pandemic, um, and we can go on and on and on, even uh, the, the way how we were able to handle the Brexit 60 years ago, this would be a war, but uh, something is profoundly going right on the level of the EU. So whenever we're gonna be discussing uh, even our sovereignty, uh, and uh, our autonomy, uh, we need to be very, very careful that it doesn't mean isolation. Uh, and yet you already said that the EU is very clear that that doesn't mean that it will close itself, but it's a very dangerous game, especially when we're talking about technology, because it's so easy to set up a closed hierarchical system uh, with no transparency. Uh, and um, that is not a good, uh, news for the world. One of the biggest challenges, of course, in this is, as you mentioned already, to build trust. And there is no way we're gonna build trust with technology. The trust is built with an open, direct, person-to-person -person communication and relationship. It's the only way forward is to build quality relationships that are supported by technology. If we're going to let the engineers, and by the way, I'm an engineer, computer engineer. Uh, so if you let the engineers to set up the system, uh, they will do a perfect system, but it will not necessarily serve the humanity. So uh, I'm very much uh, now advocating relationship first and then technological solutions, even though that means much more efforts, much more honesty, much more trust on all sides, and be patient in order to define the relationship models first and then invite technology to support them and making sure that they really do what the, the people decided to have and not impose a more simple uh, and more uh, controlled solutions through which they can then define their own future. So that is also my biggest concern when I talk uh, about uh, technology is first of all, a concept of ownership. We have not, even after all these years, and let's say the first computer was done in 1958. And since then we have not defined any concept of uh, ownership in the field of technologies. 
meaning uh, accountability versus stu and stewardship uh, over the results. We left it all to technological giants, which are actually getting bigger and bigger and more and more dominant. And uh, if we continue to go in this way, so the corporate organization of the world, which is in many uh, circles mind, uh, is a very likable choice, but we need to be very careful there. I mean, I'm a businesswoman and I've been running uh, different types of entrepreneurships. Uh, and I know that once you are in a business model, you have to watch out for your bottom line. So the priority is to create enough capital for a continuous development of your corporate environment. While uh, uh, country level, while states, they are responsible for the well being of people first and then the rest. Uh, so in corporate worlds, the well being of people is one of the strategies. So that has to be very clear when we are cooperating. So, concept of ownership. Uh, as I said, accountability over assets uh, for the next generation uh, is a big topic and it's all around big data, uh, which again, we have no governance over that. Uh, then uh, shared experiences, common knowledge and awareness that we're developing. We still have not agreed on that. The only no things that we know is say uh, intellectual property, but in many instances, that is very unfair model. It's a very strong imperialistic mentality that is behind that. So if we really wanna create a world that will be sustainable, these are the questions need to be answered and relooked and reinvented and assumptions need to be rechecked. Um, again, where is the focus? Ownership uh, versus uh, users' rights. Here, Europe has a unique uh, position. We have three emerging models on a global scale. One is uh, China, Russia, and uh, similar countries-based model where country owns everything. Country owns all the data. For example, in China, they even set the data dam, which means no data created in China can leave China. Yeah, so uh, that is one of the models. Is that how we want to see the world? Yes, if the whole world is one big uh, database, then I can sign under that because everybody will be then able to tap into it. Uh, but um, if not, that means that we have a lot of protectionism and a, very, a lot of closed uh, ecosystems uh, that don't interact and we cannot benefit from the uh, learning processes and uh, freshly acknowledge, uh, um, freshly developed knowledge. The other one is uh, American model and everybody who follows that where corporations own everything except when is the subject of security, uh, national security. So that is again a danger. And we see where, uh, where that is leading. It's leading towards the models of transhumanism, uh, models to surveillance capitalism, uh, mo models towards singularity, which nobody has any control over. There is no whatsoever governance that could monitor this kind of developments, nothing. Everything is in the hands of, uh, of owners of this uh, high-tech giants. So uh, this is a serious concern. European way, which is gaining few supporters around the world now, is that we are moving away from the ownership of data and we're focusing on users' rights. It's a very noble model, but we have no infrastructure for it either. It's a big confusion on a field. So putting on this undefined uh, legal and um, let's say, a structure that is in place and even technological structure, uh, a future of uh, tech world is very unstable, uh, very unstable strategy. So I have a concerns around that, of course, and uh, I would very much welcome a deep discussion on, uh, about it. For example, that means let me show, uh, share with you one concrete example from transport. We, uh, uh, while I was in, in, in Brussels, one of the core topics we try to get all stakeholders of European transport community and beyond on the level of United Nations on board to keep open APIs, application uh, interfaces on a horizontal and vertical level. Meaning that whichever solution you produce, they are agreed standards that uh, the systems will always be interoperable. And this is such a profound and essential element of the future tech world. 
but it's unbelievably difficult to even get close to it. Because of course, every business uh, ecosystem knows that if they have monopoly, they rule the world and that's what they are uh, motivated by. So uh, they will always try to lobby and they were very successful in lobbying against open systems, against open APIs, against interoperability, against uh, bringing multiple solutions together like in transport that meant multimodality. I cannot tell you how hard it was to pass any kind of law in that respect. Um, and many times we failed uh, and I still have few pains uh, and, and sort of uh, black spots because we could not get it through something that was so logical, so important, but the lobbyists were just too hard. And if they couldn't do it within the commission and the parliament, they were very successful in the council where of course, prime ministers have four year cycles um, and they are very sensitive uh, for the local uh, lobbyist uh, activities. So uh, this is where, I'm inviting you all to put uh, additional attention and really understand that these are essential elements have nothing to do really with the technology per se, but with setting up the environment where technology can really serve and not dominate. And for example, another one, it's in artificial intelligence. The first uh, strategy on artificial intelligence was set, uh, was put forward during our mandate, very short document based on which now white paper has been produced. And I still remember the fight over one sentence that at the end of every artificial technology, there has to be a button and a, a name responsible for that button so that you can always switch on and off. But what is now the key trend with the pushing uh, 5G forward? That there is no button. You know what that means? that sooner or later you, have, you will have no idea who's actually responsible for what in the high-tech world. And the, then the high-tech will really become a goal, not a tool. So these are my concerns uh, that I'd really like to discuss with you. And uh, what we could do is develop a serious discussion about the concept nature one, nature two, nature three, uh, which the nature three has not been really well defined. However, uh, uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, nature one is uh, the time uh, and the place where we lived in accordance uh, with the laws of nature in the nature. And then we started to create communities and cities. And that's what we call nature two. When people started to go back to the countryside for vacation, for, exper for, for additional experience. But as we know today, 80% of all population is concentrated in the cities already. And so we had to set up many new infrastructure means in order to ensure that this communication is going on. But what is happening today? The nature three is information. And uh, this is the virtual world. And you can see, especially with youngsters, that they live in virtual world. And time to time, we can bring them back to, at the table to eat lunch, or maybe even pull them back to go in nature and camp for a week or two. And they are back into their virtual world. So this nature three has not been defined yet. So we have an ideal situation that we really uh, maybe around this concept, bring the world together. And here is a chance for Asia and EU to sincerely cooperate, but not with competition over who's gonna create a higher level of uh, artificial intelligence and more uh, dominant system, but around the basic human principles uh, that, that will define the humanity in the nature three and the role of humanity. Are we giving up on homo sapiens civilization and just uh, talking about a new transhuman uh, civilizational paradigm where uh, we're gonna just create new species which will be a combination of technology and humans? Or like I see it, I, I see it with every single technological advances, I see how profound the human being really is and how much more we can evolve and develop understanding how little capacity that we have, we are already engaging in our decision-making process, in our creative process and in our collaborative models. So um, I hope I raised few of the issues. I hope I brought few of the topics on the table that are worth discussing. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing your 
points of view uh, and uh, continue to maybe challenge everything through the point of view of possible next eco-civilizational paradigm where uh, beings, not only humans, but beings uh, continue to evolve and through the inter-species uh, communication and through the holistic approach um, and uh, system thinking, we can actually uh, give humanity another chance and um, evolve together uh, with oral knowledge the proper tools that will keep us uh, to thrive uh, towards uh, the next century. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Commissioner, for your um, a very profound message. I think that is resonating um, much further, um, well, much more beyond the framework of just the current um, discussion on the need for, for trust, but really more on the, on the broader paradigm shift um, that is really um, on the level of humanity. Um, so um, thank you so much for all those words. And definitely, I think a lot of uh, food for thought and input for the discussion afterwards. Um, for now, I'm really happy to shift slowly forward to our expert panel. Uh, we are very delighted to have um, such a broad variety of, of you joining today. Um, and uh, continuing with the roundtable, we're hosting three very esteemed scholars and practitioner, uh, practitioners showcasing the true European diversity, um, both in the nationalities, but also in, in the knowledge. Um, so with us today, starting the expert roundtable, I would like to invite forward the um, 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 Ms. Uh, Mireya Paolo, who is currently a lecturer and research associate at the EU Asia Relations and Modern Chinese Studies at the Faculty of East Asian Studies at Ruhr University in Bochum. Um, she's an, also, uh, apart from her research role, she's also an arbiter at uh, SHIAC and a senior consultant at Chinese law firm uh, ANZ. Uh, and her research emphasis is strongly focused on the EU-China domestic digital technology policy, legal systems, and particularly looking at the data governance and their importance in global digital affairs. So, um, Ms. Paolo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction um, and also for the invitation. I'm very pleased um, to be here um, for this roundtable. I would like to start um, on in the interest of time, right? So let me focus on three points uh, when addressing the issue of strategic autonomy. And I would like to start by conceptualizing. I think it's important to define the framework because depending on how we consider it, we have uh, different approaches. And so a general widely accepted understanding of these terms implies the independence, the control, or the autonomy over digital infrastructure and technologies, but also business models, contents, and data. It seems from a European approach, it is more a journey than an end destination. I actually recently hear an interview to Jim Clues, who was describing this term as a process, not an end product. So meaning a tool to pursue a specific objectives, but not necessarily achieves those. Uh, if you instead see it as an end point, then you actually believe that you can finally reach some end state with the specific time period, and then you have a very clear vision of what that means. I point, the point I would like to make is that unfortunately, no common understanding exists. And the fact that sometimes we call it um, a strategic sovereignty, autonomy, technological, digital, sovereignty, it false critics uh, for being too ambiguous or even having contradictory approaches. And so that the unclear focus of what the strategic autonomy entails or should entail increases the risk for policy inconsistencies. I believe we do have to conceptualize. However, we also need to recognize that the more precise we want to be, the more difficult will be sometimes to move forward. For that reason, maybe looking at which strategic areas or this transversal areas would be also important to push forward um, this autonomy. My second point uh, related to the first one is that for many, uh, autonomy um, covers multiple areas and as a result, the progress towards autonomy can take 
on different aspects. Um, I think it, this is an important point to make because traditionally we talk about um, sovereignty or um, autonomy with a strong association uh, with the defense and security issues. But from the last years, uh, there has been a great recognition that this is something that covers other dimensions and obviously the digital sphere um, when it comes to digital capabilities and digital independence covering critical sectors. And here, I do agree also with uh, previous speakers talking about data and cloud infrastructure, among others. Uh, to me, that's a very crucial part, <laughs> moving from international, uh, from the internet governance to data governance. But also, I think in multiple areas and different speeds are also observed at different levels, right? So we could say the perception of the global powers we could say the perception of different member states and also uh, actors and stakeholders, because this is a very diverse um, environment. And the last third point um, I would like to highlight, it links again to this transversal issues, right? I think we really need to analyze uh, from different perspectives if we want to uh, think about uh, or uh, implement or enforce uh, the different dimensions that this uh, autonomy, technological autonomy uh, implies. So while the EU has managed to establish leadership, for example, in legal instruments, we all uh, think about the GDPR, but again, this is just personal data. It doesn't cover all data. And then also we have a standard setting in various industrial sectors, but Unfortunately, in other cutting edge uh, areas such as cloud infrastructure or collecting and using data or even semiconductors uh, feel well, it's less evident. So in view of this potential vulnerabilities, right, that is um, resulting from both economic dependence and the lack of this competitive innovation, still there are obviously some efforts made. So for example, we have some programs and strategies that have, um, have been put in place, such as, uh, for example, the Open Science Cloud or the new industrial strategy. We also have some legislative activity addressing digital matters, such as um, the Data Governance Act, the Digital Service Act, or the, for example, AI Desk, or in the cyberspace, we have the cyber cell with the toolbox and the strategy. However, um, going back to the point uh, made when conceptualizing, so allow me to mention some uh, concrete areas or maybe some dimensions that I think it might be important to move forward. And maybe we can uh, uh, discuss also um, during the, the discussion time. But when it comes to the dimension of security, not just in the traditional way, but also coming from this data governance, right? Uh, I think this is quite important. Also, when it comes to legal and economic, we do have also other aspects such as taxation. Uh, when it comes to uh, technical or talent, uh, I think we sometimes forget the talent dimension, right? The non-how dimension behind. And so with this, uh, due to the time, Allow me to conclude by saying that the development or implementation of the autonomy is obviously a key challenge that uh, Europe is facing now. I think it is not taking place in a vacuum. We have a very interesting geopolitical world right now. We have different actors and obviously we need to collaborate and negotiate you know, with those uh, actors. And I finished here, I just noticed <laughs> the time. So I will finish here. Uh, hopefully I didn't uh, pass my five minutes. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much, uh, Mireya. Mireya. Um, I will ask to unmute our next speaker, um, Andre. Just a second. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Mireya. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting input for the discussion forward. And I'm really happy to now invent, 
invite forward to the, our virtual podium our second expert, uh, André losenkruk peter um, who is the chairman of Joint European Disruptive Initiative, YEDI, uh, uh, with the aim of accelerating Europe's technological leadership. Um, YEDI aims, uh, aims are at financing and nurturing the development of breakthrough technologies, so really the European moon, sh moon shooting factory. Um, um, Mr. Losegruk Peter is also a member of the Forum of Young Global Leaders and a founder of the AC, AC Capital, and has previously also posts, had held numerous posts um, in the security world, uh, including for the French Ministry of Defense. So without further ado, um, André, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matish, and very, very happy to be on this, on this uh, panel, uh, despite not seeing my, my old friend Wei Shen, but uh, uh, I was very impressed, especially by the previous speakers and uh, uh, Miss Commissioner, very nice to meet you again. Um, uh, in the interest of time, let me focus on three points uh, to be complementary to has, what has just been said. One is I will take a technological uh, angle and, and, and try to give you some, some perspectives on what is happening right now to the implication on our democratic societies and how they react uh, uh, towards other type of uh, uh, um, uh, regimes and also towards the, the emergence of these new, uh, new countries, as, as I call them, these 2 billion countries, uh, uh, also known as Facebook, face, uh, WhatsApp, and, and others. And third, possible solutions or, or views that we could discuss uh, during the, the exchange afterwards. So first, I mean, we're experiencing this deep tech revolution and I'm not 100% sure that it's completely understood what is really happening. First, we are seeing, uh, contrary to what happened in the past, a convergence of many scientific fields. And this is completely new. I mean, we used to think in industries, in, in, in the French, we call that filière, you know, we, we talked about automotive or aerospace or energy. Today, we see that most of the technological breakthroughs, which are a little bit at the tip of the iceberg, are coming from a convergence of different, you see a digital and, and energy, you see physics and genomics uh, coming together. And this is really creating, um, creating these, these breakthroughs. The second thing, and this goes a little bit along the, 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 the very philosophical perspectives given just previously, we, we probably have not yet integrated that our business models are changing or need to change. We are coming out of 200, 300, some call it even 2000 years of consumption societies. We used to, to, you know, to slaughter cows to make leather and meat. Uh, we will need, we, we use mines to produce our, our raw products and, and, and our, our raw material. We probably need to go to a, to a, to a society where we, we will need to create, to generate, to, to construct, to support. And this is a radical shift in probably everything we do, we consume. We, and, and this is really also the, 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 the source of these breakthroughs. You could call uh, artificial proteins. You can call it uh, products which are you know, for the skin care. I mean, you see it everywhere. Uh, in, in, the, in the emerging technologies. And last but not least is the collapsing of time. Uh, time is probably more important than money, more important than intelligence, more important than everything else. The ones who are not ahead of the curve are, will be increasingly dependent on others. And this real strategic autonomy would probably come from that. Those who have foresight, those who are able to anticipate uh, in a complex world, which by definition is unpredictable, uh, will have an advantage, or at least will have the, 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 the impression, we talked about Brexit, to have some sort of control. Those who are running behind the, the stock market, those who are running behind the curve of masks, of, of vaccines, or others, will always be, 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 be late. And, and this has two major consequences. The, the two key success factors in the, in the century we are in, some call it uh, the technological century, is on one side, you need to be long-term oriented. And on the other side, it's a bit contradictory. It's very Macronist in this way. Uh, you need to be super agile. 
you need to be extremely reactive and capable of adjusting to, I mean, nobody knows really what's happening in, in, in a week. Some even say not, not, not knowing what's happening in two days in, in countries like Afghanistan, for, for, for example. Uh, so what's the consequence for our democratic societies? First, we're experiencing some kind of a Stockholm uh, complex. We love to hate the big platforms and we have never used them uh, as much as we do. Uh, I, I give an example of my, my country, uh, France, you know, who, who, who loves to hate the GAFAs. And on the other side, uh, Renault is putting all its industrial data on Google Cloud and, uh, and our health data hub is managed by Microsoft. And, uh, uh, but my other country, uh, Germany, uh, you know, uh, Deutsche Telekom is relying heavily on Huawei for its uh, technology. So you have this, 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 um, this paradox. The second thing is we need to ask ourselves if the way we're doing laws and regulation is still adapted to the time. Uh, we had the high moral ground on, on things like GDPR. We probably have anticipated with regulation like DSA, uh, the, the importance of the, of the platforms. But if you think that these regulation took three, four, five years uh, to be put in place and DSA at best will be enacted end of next year, uh, by the European Parliament and probably will take one or two more years uh, to be translated in national policy. I mean, the platforms full of smart people will have a lot of time to adjust. And, and, uh, and this is what they did, by the way, with GDPR, where you see uh, one or two of them becoming the heroes of GDPR. I don't think they became value-wise better, but they just understood that that could be turned into a, into a competitive advantage. Look at how Microsoft and especially uh, Apple is riding the, 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 the new wave of privacy. I don't think they saw the light, but I think they understood it's in their business, uh, in, in their business interest. Uh, last but not least, standards. It was also uh, evoked by, by the commissioner before. Standards is a capacity to, uh, to, to, you know, to put everybody according to your vision and some would say to your values. We don't use that enough. Uh, the US recently launched a, a post-quantum cryptography. It sounds very technical, a challenge by the Department of Commerce, which basically will be the standard for cryptography, which is basically ruling our digital world, the passwords, the identity in which we are when quantum computing will exist. So there are solutions. There are solutions provided we have this, this long-term strategy. And so let me conclude on, on a couple of solutions. One, I strongly believe that this concept of pop-up regulation, you know, we know pop-up stores, should be applied to this digital age. Because you might be right, but if you uh, put a regulation out six or 12 or 18 months too late, the risk is that either your uh, value adversaries will be uh, smarter and, and will be faster than you, or you will be, uh, there will be an opportunity cost and you will already be dependent. So this concept of you know, putting up a regulation without waiting too long to have a very long consensus on it, see what happens and be agile to, to adapt it. And look right now, there was a whole debate on GDPR, it should be adapted because it's now already a couple of years old. And since it was such an effort uh, to put it through to parliament, that, that now everybody says, oh, let's not open the Pandora box. So the risk is then that if, if, if the hurdle to make a regulation is too high, the risk is obviously then it's very difficult so it, it bec uh, to, to change it and adapt it to an to ever-changing world. Second thing is this concept that companies have integrated. Um, countries, if they want to prevail, if we want to prevail, um, you know, uh, societies that are rule uh, that, are, that are defined by, by, by rule of law, that they still need to prevail compared to, to business interests. And I too have a, have a private uh, career behind me. They need to adapt what is today a, a way of functioning in this world is testing, developing very fast, expanding where it works, learn out of it. And this is probably the component that is insufficiently uh, developed in our modern uh, democratic societies is this asse permanent assessment. Per, it does not mean that we need to be, you know, like with polls uh, um, conducted by, by short-term views, but we need to permanently understand if a regulation we have enacted uh, has an impact for society and citizen. And this is not done enough. 
And I think this is probably a, a great improvement. Uh, uh, third, uh, and, and these are two concepts that I will take together, is time and foresight. Uh, democratic societies need to integrate in this technological age, this capacity of thinking long-term, uh, this capacity of anticipating, not fighting the battles of today because they already lost. I mean, you know, low earth orbit satellites, uh, uh, silicon chips, uh, traditional cloud computing. I don't want to say we don't need to be at the level uh, where we need to be, but these are the battles of today. What are the battles of tomorrow? And this is the beauty of the technological age is that there is no um, position that is, that is held forever. Provi provided you think the next big thing, you can uh, anticipate and, and, uh, and reshuffle the cards. And this is, by the way, why these platforms are permanently buying their competitors is not only to expand their market share because they know that there will be solutions that, that will be better than the Facebooks, the, the WeChats or the, or, the, or the TSMCs of the world. And this is, uh, and this is very difficult because anticipation in this, in this moving and complex world is increasingly Completely. So I stop here and happy to have the discussion. Thank you so much, Andrea. I was just about to jump in and, and try to, to um, um, pass on to our last speaker. Um, like that. Um, so without um, further ado, um, I would like to now pass the virtual stage to our last speaker, Dr. Miguel Otero Iglesias who is the senior analyst at El Cano Royal Institute and the professor at the, of practice at the EE uh, School of Global and Public Affairs. Dr. Otero um, Iglesias worked at, uh, as a research um, associate at the EU Asia Institute at the uh, ESSCA School of Management in France and was probably also an assistant professor in international political economy at uh, uh, same uh, university and adjunct lecturer at the Queen Elizabeth House at the University of Oxford, where he also uh, received his um, PhD. So um, Dr. Miguel Otero Iglesias, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Matic, and the uh, Europe Asia Center, and Wei Shen, even though he's not here for convening us. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a political economist that has uh, recently really entered the, the field of technology. Uh, as Andre just mentioned, I think we are an age where a lot of disciplines come together, not only sectors, but as well disciplines. And, uh, you know, for someone that has been always interested in, uh, in, in power and the balance of, of, of power relations, uh, of course, uh, understanding the technological revolution and its impact in society is key. And, uh, you know, for, for the sake of time as well, I, I thought I would structure my, my five minutes comments in, in, into three uh, large uh, points um, and, and hopefully we'll have a bit of time for discussion. As I say, you know, I'm entering really this field, but I, at IE, uh, you know, university, I'm going to lead for the next years uh, a big project uh, called actually uh, the Digital Revolution and the New Social Contract. Uh, so I will dedicate most of my time from now on really on on tech and its societal impact. Um, so the three points are first, I think context, uh, we have not talked enough about it. I mean, I think we are, uh, you know, the, the, um, the fall of the Berlin Wall until the global financial crisis, those 20 years, roughly 1989 till 2008 were um, uh, an exception in, in, in world affairs. Uh, you know, we had a, uh, uh, the United States being a, a super puissance, uh, a, a really kind of the hyper power uh, that dominated, and it was very, very kind of, kind of you know, one minded in, in many, in many senses. But that that is that is really an exception. Usually, you have great power competition, and and we are in a great power competition. That's our context, uh, and we we need to I think in Europe uh, adapt to that. You know, the, the past is the past. Uh, which was, you know, the, the, the liberal or neoliberal order we had for for for, for uh, some decades, but now we are really in a, in a in a moment where the United States and China, for the next decades, will compete uh, in all areas. And we had trade wars, but as well we are into into tech wars. Uh, Huawei's uh, kind of example of what happened there, uh, it's 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 a big, you know case, and and so. That's the context, and this context will not go away. 
uh, as much as we uh, would like it to go away. And I think within that context, we have essentially as well different cultures. And, uh, you know, in Europe, I think we have still a very Eurocentric approach on values, on human rights, on, on our perspective. And we have still have, you know, this legacy of the past that the, the, the European way should be the way of the world and that we have this missionary kind of uh, instinct of, of saying, look, you know, that this is the most uh, civilized, the most kind of uh, advanced way of society and how society should move. And, and I, again here, you know, I think we, we might be an illusion, right? Um, from an international political economy perspective, traditionally you have four key values, right? Four key values that all societies have, which are security, wealth, uh, justice, and freedom. And I would, I would contend that, uh, you know, uh, from a Chinese perspective, the most important of those four values is security, harmony, security. From an American perspective, you know, the most important one uh, is perhaps uh, wealth, and under the understanding that that wealth will bring you freedom, right? And, and from a European perspective, perhaps the most important in these four values is is justice. We believe that you know justice, equality will bring us freedom, right? But these are very different conceptions of values and how you you know uh, order those, the hierarchy of those, and 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 so you know in a great power competition context with different you know hierarchies of values which translate into all sorts of different rights, uh, it is very difficult to have a overriding global governance, as Violeta was telling us uh, right at the beginning, how difficult it is, you know, it is even difficult in Europe, so it's even more difficult to do it at the global level. Um, and so, uh, you know, we are seeing that different models are evolving and how they use technology. And technology in the Chinese case, and I've been studying China for, for over a decade, uh, uh, you know, is now used to, in a society that is an a, a authoritarian society, is now used in a way to, to, to create trust, right? Uh, coming back to, to some of Violetta's points. I mean, it, it sounds a bit paradoxical from a, from a European perspective, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a society that would lack trust, like every authoritarian society lacks, the usage of technology by the state brings trust into interpersonal relations, because then through the social, it is badly translated into English, the social credit system, it is, you know, there are multiple social trust systems because there's not only one in China. You know, this is very kind of, you know, every province, every city, you know, they are experimented with different systems. But, but the idea here is that I can see your score. So if your score, according to the algorithm, you know, that is neutral and, you know, uh, sanctioned by the state uh, that that brings me your trust because I know that you have a high score. And so I think that's that's, that's important how, how technology now fuses into the, the culture, the values of our societies. And this brings me really kind of to, because, you know, I didn't really want more, more than five minutes, just a few points. This brings us really kind of, you know, to, uh, and uh, here with Andre on foresight, what, what looks, the, what the, the future looks like, right? And up, up to now, you know, I, I, I just see, you know, from a European perspective, what are our options, right? One option is, look, we stay into the American technological ecosystem, right? It governs us, uh, you know, from where I, you know, get up in the morning, I use Twitter, I use uh, uh, WhatsApp, I use Zoom, I use, right, uh, you know, LinkedIn to, to, to when I go to bed, basically, you know, I'm in the, you know, in the American ecosystem. And, you know, some people would say, you know, that's fine. Another is like, you know, let's try to be in both ecosystems that are emerging, right? I mean, we are Europeans, we are getting older, we are exporting a lot, we are dependent on others' growth and dynamism. And so we need to be in the American system, but we cannot, you know, afford to not be in the Chinese emerging or already here ecosystem, right? And so for a lot of companies all over Europe now, the big, you know, kind of, discussion is uh, what do we do right i mean we want to be in the united states but we want also to be in china uh, china increasingly through uh, digital sovereignty is kind of imposing its own you know technology standards etc and we need to go in both right and then you know that brings us you know trouble with americans because americans say no 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 
you need to be in our ecosystem. You cannot be in the Chinese one, right? And the 5G discussion, I think, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a good example. Um, the third one would be, uh, no, let's try to have, and that, you know, goes back to Violetta's points, uh, global governance, right, system. So interoperability between those ecosystems, create a, you know, global uh, ecosystem with these ecosystems they speak to, they engage with, you know, that, that we preserve, you know, this kind of more world uh, view. And, and, and that's, that's a mega effort. And the fourth is let's create our own ecosystem, right? Um, but you know the question is here, and again to Andre's points and, and Mireya's as well that you know alluded to that. You know how do you do that? I mean, uh, do you do it on the basis of infrastructure from others, on the clouding of others, on the giants of corporate American giants? Do you want to do it, you know, from scratch? Is it just a, you know the legal the legal affairs that the regulation and standards, or do you actually need to actually Build this, this thing, create your own internet of things, create your own platforms, create your own cloud, et cetera. And, and, you know, I'm not discovering anything new, but I think we should, again, think about hierarchies. You know, which of these, you know, uh, scenarios is, 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 is for us priority number one? Is it a global interoperable uh, system? Is it a, a, a European uh, ecosystem? Or perhaps, you know, those, you know, there is a way of overlapping some of them. You know, some people would say, look, what the Europeans need to do is to infuse more social, more human-centered uh, governance into the American system. And, and perhaps that then can create, you know, or build into a more global uh, system. But again, you know, China, and I finish with this, as you all know, now has, has proposed, uh, proposed already the new internet protocol, uh, you know, at the International Telecommunication Union, I think they're advancing, they, they have a much more state-centric approach on how internet should be governed. And a lot of states, Iran, Saudi Arabia, perhaps, you know, states in Africa, states in Latin America, they are starting to be persuaded by this, you know, more state-centric, more co controlled uh, internet model. And, and therefore we are really in a moment where, where we need to, to, to focus on our priorities. I would suggest that the European uh, priority should be actually to, uh, given this context of uh, your great power rivalry, creating your own uh, ecosystem, just in case. Thanks. I'm sorry for, for... Thank you so much, Miguel. I think we, we obviously are already running out of time, but I think every, there is so much input here that it's, um, I think that, that probably was expectable. Um, actually, just kind of transitioning to the discussion, I would really like to open the floor to uh, for each and one of you to comment on some of the things, but to kind of kick it off, I actually just wanted to pick up on the, the last point you made, Miguel now, um, which was actually on the on the on the um, on the note of the future and you know on the foresight dimension, the importance of the foresight. Uh, so what would then really be the there was already some of uh, indications about the opportunities or challenges for really um, creating or getting to this new um, um, new paradigm of the co um, you know multinational cooperation in the internet era, and I open the floor for everybody, of course. Okay, let me break the ice, if I may, because every minute it's very valuable here. Um, I mean, I enjoyed every single uh, statement that uh, you guys shared. It's uh, really exciting to see that uh, we are actually talking uh, about the essence of the future of our society, not only about the gains. And uh, what, what I can see is that um, understanding better how to tap into emergence, it will be essential uh, because nothing can be really predictable because whatever you predict, you the only thing you know it's not gonna that it's not gonna happen uh, so what i'm learning now is to really uh, live by uh, so-called vuca and rupta principles yeah that, that uh, to understand and here europe has a chance why because we are uh, the only continent that represents the diversity not only in languages and nation but in cultures in in history uh, that can uh, sort of simulate the world. No other continents have the same level of uh, historical 
uh, yeah, diversity than we have. And it's not always positive, which is also good because that's where the true learning comes from. So if we can start joining forces and like uh, Andre and Miguel and also uh, Mireya, you know, you have uh, access to, to, to networks that actually are think tanks. And uh, let's bring these discussions of uh, VUCA principles into the place and start learning because there is no systems uh, at this point that actually can address the volatile, uncertain, uh, complex and ambiguous models. But that's what nature is all about. You know, we are trying to squeeze uh, something that uh, is so dynamic into linear or horizontal or uh, static structures. And what is happening right now all around the world is that people are waking up. There is something in the air, some sort of fresh frequency is happening. And we are breaking this uh, static frameworks within which we uh, we even we were growing up and we see that it life is much more than just this kind of simple uh, structural uh, approach so um, let's let's try to uh, also work with the uh, rupta uh, rupta principles which is rapid unpredictable paradoxical entangled why we don't have this in scientific modeling why don't we have this kind of behavior uh, in our simulations and you see, with, this is the challenge that we have with the climate change uh, uh, modeling, because we are not trying to simulate the nature. We're trying to simulate the current human mind, mind which is very structured and, of course, unable to, to, to respond to these complex challenges. What do you think about that? I'm not going to give a, like a, an answer, obviously, I will ask uh, even more questions. I mean, uh, you, you talked about the VUCA principle, Violetta. Um, uh, I, I think we are living this exponential age and, and probably our cognitive minds are increasingly unable to handle that because we are very incremental in our, in our approaches and that's how we are, how we are built. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the fact that today things are exponential, I think this word was a technocratic word, now it's a very popular word with, with the pandemic. Uh, we need to adapt uh, everything, the way we live, the, the way we do policymaking. And, and a, a question to you, because you were, uh, you were at the heart of how the EU is, is, is the fabric of the EU. Um, I, I'm, I'm with you, I think this merging of, of disciplines, like uh, Peter Ridley, uh, Miguel Ridley said, uh, is uh, is uh, is increasing. Our diversity should be a force. We have not translated that into a force yet. Uh, today, it's more, as we say in mathematics, the the smallest common de denominator. Often, too often, uh, not always, but too often. How can we translate that? May I just quickly put another? But I would love to hear Miguel and, and Mirella, and also, of course, uh, Pierre and uh, Patrick. Um, yeah, and uh, look, just a very simple challenge that uh, together we can address it. The pollution or negative externalities that result in one trillion per year only from transport in the EU, which means about between six and seven percent of European GDP. We're aware of that. The transport is generating that, but who pays the price? Not transport, health, social frameworks accidents cause the uh, uh, traumas in families, uh, the pollution cause uh, premature uh, deaths in 400,000 people only in Europe per year. Uh, so uh, in order to address this challenge, it cannot be addressed by transport itself or by health itself. We have to bring health and transport ministers together at the same table that they plan together, that they think together. And of course, it's needless to say to bring also the energy ministers at the table because uh, transport, if, want, if transport wants to uh, uh, change its negative impact, it needs a more cleaner energy. So why is it so difficult? I could not get these ministers at the same table, even though, okay, at least we wrote about that. But uh, so let's start generating these horizontal ecosystems that are depending on each other because one bears the investment, the other one bears the negative externalities. So if they don't work together, we will never reach the desired goals because they're gonna constantly have different motivations and different goals. 
So, uh, and this is where high tech can help us as a tool to bring them together because uh, to build the governance models that actually show these interdependencies and that they show that you cannot just uh, grasp uh, or um, use all the investments that are available without really uh, being held responsible for the negative externalities. Why is that so difficult? I mean, uh, we tried. We tried with multimodality. We tried with many interfaces, um, but it's not enough just one portfolio or one person or one small group. Somehow we need to start talking about it as a common interest and get it through because, uh, and this is very much related to this long-term uh, vision and foresight that uh, you, you mentioned because um, four years elective cycles are completely in contradiction with this kind of thinking. And Europe has to start thinking thousand years. It has to start thinking 100 years of operational strategy. It has to start thinking 50, uh, 30 years of actions. And everything else has to become a subject of that. Then we, we will be able to grasp the natural behavior and this book and root principles. I, I have a big hope because there is so much that we have not used yet. Uh, so these discussions that we have today are so promising. Let me let me build on on what uh, um, Violeta just said. Uh, I think uh, you know breaking the culture of silos is perhaps one of the biggest challenge we have. Uh, and I think for a long time, and you mentioned Violeta. I mean, you know, ministries, and I see it in my country, and but I've been involved in many, numerous kind of as well as strategic reviews, uh, and 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 kind of you know how certain ministries they compete with each other they hardly talk to each other and uh, lately we have done as well some work comparative work with other you know what are the best practices and i have to say that you know some countries the uk actually lately perhaps perhaps as well as a response uh, to brexit has been doing quite a lot of work in trying to have a more all of government approach and how how you know from number 10 etc how do you coordinate more kind of the work that you do within departments within kind of between departments uh, uh, or ministries you know and and i think that would be a big big difference in, in the coming years and not only kind of you know that to make the government so so that because you you uh, matic you you asked about the cooperation right and i think the, the future of the cooperation is important but I think the, the the future of our state state bureaucracies, you know, our our state craft, is much more important. Is 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 our state uh, bureaucracy ready for for the twenty first century? And I would say that most are not, right? And in a moment where the state is back back in, right, because of this, you know, uh, uh, great power rivalry, if we don't have uh, what Andre said within our state capacity, state apparatus, which is strategic view and agility, both, and then uh, you are in trouble, right? Uh, we see it now, for example, with the EU next generation, right? EU next generation, this is a lot of money coming in, but now you need to have the capacity by the state to actually process this. And not only you need to kind of almost transform the state apparatus, you need as well to improve big time the relationship between the state and the public uh, sector and the private sector and, and the corporations and the, 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 the small and medium-sized enterprises. And I think societies that do this best will be the ones leading the future, really. And again, there, we have all sorts of silos, all sorts of ideological trenches. You know, we have views of the public sector is best or the private sector does it best. In our societies, at least in my society in Spain, but I think it's common in most societies today in the West, you have this very entrenched view of the private sector knows best, or no, we need more public, you know, investment, or the public, you know, should be uh, the one uh, leading. And I think the cooperation between them, you know, that will be key. And that it's not easy, but I think our our future depends on it. I think I might be the last one, right? <laughs> so um, linking a little bit what it has been said and also in the legal practice that I have in Europe and China. So I think that as, um, this also in the internal process in Europe, we have the supranational and member states levels and 
uh, even competition, right? And this is sometimes translated also in our coherent actions, for example, when it comes to standardization, I think it was also pointed out before, I think this, uh, the non-binding uh, legal rules are also very important coming also with private uh, actors, although it might be a little bit elitist group uh, in the international organization, right? But it brings also um, a strong element to this uh, autonomy. There is also another issue here when it comes, for example, to digital tax systems, where also member states are competing. And so that is also an aspect to include in this uh, discussion, right? Where we want to go, which is also linked to the debate of um, the regulatory framework uh, being a bit too protectionism or being uh, in favor of specific uh, companies or industrial market within the member states, not even talking about um, the global or the trade uh, environment. Uh, but also I think there is um, coming to this uh, trade law and also data governance, particularly when it comes to um, in the international, right, what we call now this uh, global uh, data law ideas, right, where uh, more um, emphasis, for example, in a typology of um, data and also in uh, including in the regulatory framework of trade agreements, uh, those typologies, I think it's also quite relevant shaping uh, the discussion and the developments now having said so. <laughs> I'm not that in favor of regulating everything and just uh, pushing uh, on the regulatory frame and as a strong uh, and unique element. I think the convergences of other uh, sectors and dimensions, I call it dimensions, but you know that this divergence is also quite important. And it's important also related to the um, point mentioned before about the long-term planning the long-term strategy, especially if we think about uh, the PRC, right? Where we have uh, strategies in a very long-term, uh, very strategic, very pragmatic with very specific goals. For example, when it goes to identifying 30,000 or 35,000 uh, engineers working in AI by uh, 2030, or when having, uh, we have a data cloud or data center strategy where we want to be the, the world center, right? So those um, planning, those strategies is for us in Europe or the European Union is, is very complicated also how to deal with it or how to manage those. And also in terms of capabilities, of course, uh, from the private sector and the experiences with uh, tech companies, we also advocate for PPP, so for public private partnerships, right? But then it comes again, the interest. And so we are again competing with those interests, but also even if we think about alliances, sometimes there is this discourse about West is uh, fractions and division that I don't personally like very much. <laughs> but uh, you know, even though we also have differences with the, the US, for example, when it comes to privacy, Sold or you know the defense of consumers or the application, the utility of those uh, technologies. I also think it's quite important to remember that maybe in Europe, you know, we are too comfort and a bit less entrepreneurial or less um, uh, thinking on how to apply this technology in a more monetized. So how to use the thinking, how to use the innovation, how to use the in, uh, the research into the market and for the consumers, you know, this usage of the technology. I think sometimes it's also or what I perceive, right? Uh, after living so many uh, years in China. So I think sometimes this convergence is we also need to put it into a more practical applicability uh, instead of framing and limiting what is, is being done. And I conclude here. Thank you very much, Mira. Pete, do you want to add some closing points from your side? You're muted. Pete, you're muted still. 
Yeah, thank you, Matej. Um, I have been pretty uh, silent uh, because I have been listening very carefully to this uh, discussion. Uh, a discussion I felt was uh, starting from technology, but you know, we, we, we entered into fields as philosophy. And particularly, uh, what, what I'm actually interested in is, is the uniqueness of the European approach. You know, as I said, we we are at the start of it. It's uh, Europe is waking up on, on on the importance of technology, and the uniqueness of, of Europe is to translate it into something. You know, um, you know, it was mentioned the diversity, but how do you translate that into into your policies? It's 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 uh, making it richer. It makes it makes it uh, more valuable. So um, I think this is uh, one aspect I, I really was interesting to hear is the uniqueness of the European approach. And, and I think, as I said, as we are at the beginning, there is still a lot of time to influence the debate, you know, influence not from a, a corporation uh, point of view, but from, you know, the, the point of view we probably all share among ourselves here is indeed that, you know, the, the values, you know, the, we, we we want to uphold in, in Europe. So uh, this is something I feel is very important. We didn't actually talk about the transatlantic uh, differences. I mean, we all know, you know, America is very much dictated, you know, the approach is very much dictated by the big corporations, you know, the big platforms, this is true. So I think uh, this is a fact of life in America. This is probably not the fact of life we want in, in, in Europe. So then uh, I, I think, um, the, the whole question which which was also um, uh, mentioned is you know the multilateral cooperation which is not easy at the moment you know we, we the I, I still believe uh, that we need indeed uh, to cooperate multilaterally you know with all the big players you know and uh, Europe tries to do it among the 27 you know brexit of course um, uh, is is another issue, but I still believe that even the Brits will discover how important it is to work within a a, a European paradigm, you know, instead of doing it all by by itself. So, so those are some of the points. Um, uh, I learned a lot, and I'm very happy. Also, we I I you know we met so uh, you know by Zoom, you know, with all this uh, eminent uh, panelists, and also particularly. You know, our former commissioner uh, for transport, uh, Violetta. So uh, this is what I would like to say, uh, Matic. If you have to add something, this is uh, no. On behalf of Europe Asia Center, I would really like to thank each and one of you for taking the time and really participating with all this input. I think for the next uh, webinar, we should definitely plan much more than one hour because I think we've just only but tapped on on the surface, uh, as Peter just said. Um, on the um, on, on the a few ideas that tech started with more technical dimension and really um, transition more to a philosophical you know in a way um, um, civilizational um, discussion on where the um, the direction and the paradigm is really going to be evolving. Uh, on that point, I really want to actually use the quote that um, Violeta did not show in the in the presentation, but um, and it really in a way links to the to the white paper of the EU also and you know that EU strategic autonomy must remain the right or condition to self govern. I think that point is probably a very interesting point um, that then also reflects to what Miguel mentioned as um, you know the justice being the European one of the European key values in that um, whole narrative. Um, so it will be um, very interesting how, how, the, how the EU strategic autonomy, particularly in the, in the space of internet governance is going to be evolving um, both on a short um, term uh, this debate, uh, but also more towards the foresight and long-term perspective. Um, without further ado, I would really just like to once again, thank each and one of you for participating, for joining us today and, um, and yeah, and, and I hope we can continue this discussion at some point very soon. Before finishing, 